gentleman has no interest in you whatsoever. He's only interested in your wallet. If you think your loved one is invulnerable to being a victim of financial fraud, think again. These people are artists. You, they make it their full-time job to prey on the weak. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Libby Snymer. Financial abuse is the most common form of elder abuse perpetrated most often by relatives, particularly children of the victim. It includes everything from misusing a power of attorney to phishing scams perpetrated by strangers. On today's show, we'll discuss the various forms of financial abuse and what you should know to protect yourself and your loved ones. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Financial scams are on the rise and show no signs of diminishing. In 2020, the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre received over 100,000 fraud reports, up from 46,000 in 2019 and involving nearly $160 million in losses. It can take many forms. Romance scams, investment scams and spear phishing attacks saw the largest dollar losses last year, followed by extortion and online shopping scams. Personal losses tend to be even higher when the scammer is known to the victim. Over 60% of cases are perpetrated by family or loved ones. It's an underreported crime with only a fraction of cases ever coming to light. Joining me now in studio is Stephen Brown. And Stephen, you have a story of terrible financial abuse that happened to your mother. Basically, my mother and father had worked together um, for many years, uh, and they're immigrants to the country, saved enough money to have uh, retirement. And uh, my mother also was a bookkeeper. And the last person that I thought that would be, uh, would succumb to a, a financial fraud. Uh, when my father died, uh, she suddenly said to me that she was dating a younger man who was an acquaintance of my father, uh, he was 20 years younger, and what I was happy for, I was thinking, go mom, you know, have fun. It's your, these are your, your years, enjoy. You have money, you have your, you know, you have your opportunity, you have enough health. But uh, she seemed to be less and less happy as time went on. And uh, it was because the man that she was with uh, continually said, look, I'm working, I, I can't be with you until I sell this company. And I'm going to sell this company one of these days soon. Uh, and when I do, then we're going to travel the world together. We're going to be together. I love you so much. You're my wife. You're my love. You're my partner. And um, she became less and less happy over time. And one day she asked me for money, which is weird because her, my father and her, they had saved $1.35 million. Wow. And she asked me for money all of a sudden, which would, took me by surprise. And um, it turns out that this man that she's been in love with had been asking her continually to invest in his, uh, in his business um, so that he could sell it. And four years on, he's never been with her and she's just put all her money in. She even took money out of her RRSP. She paid all the taxes for him. She's given that to him. Um, so she's destitute now. And uh, I think the, the worst part is that emotionally she's, she's so damaged because of this false love or this this, this love addiction she has to a man who's intertwined his, uh, all the promises of love and, and a life together into these investments that she's made. And all of this came in her time of need. And I wish, I feel bad I didn't see the signs. So this happened right after your father died. Yeah. And did you ever meet him? Was she ever actually with him? I met him once, uh, but most of the time, he is a phone call uh, that, that exists for her. Like once a week, he would call her. Otherwise, he's too busy, he's working, he can't be with me, would be the, uh, the statements that my mother would say. And when she said that, did you say, Mom, I'm not sure this guy is really into you? I have said that, and I continue to say that. The problem is, she is so attached and needing of his love that she's gone to this irrational place that I can't speak to. 
So even now, when she's given him all her money, she's still in love with him? Absolutely. So how did it get to this point? $1.3 million in how long? It, it happened over two years that she had given all of her money. And then over the next few years, he would continue to, he would continue to promise, next week I'll have another buyer. Do you have some more money? Because a machine broke or things like this. Um, but she had no more money left. He, the calls have declined over time. I could come up with theories as to why he stays in touch because he doesn't see her. I can assume he just doesn't want to be on her bad side or to string it along somehow. I don't really know. But, um, yeah, it just continues on, and she's just as in love with him as ever. Really? Wow. And so now, um, how does she live? Well, she has a pension plan, and she has, uh, she's got uh, an old age security, and uh, she still does a little bit of work. She as, a, she, as a bookkeeper, was fantastic for her many years. She's got a great reputation there, so no shortage of people wanting her assistance. And I'll tell you this, you know, with that question, if you think your loved one is invulnerable to being a victim of financial fraud, think again, because here is somebody who is known as being financially prudent and careful and still has ended up in a situation like this. Can I ask how old she is? She's 73. Yeah, that's pretty young. Yeah. And does she have any cognitive issues? Nope. It, the, I've asked the doctor this question, and the doctor says she's able to function in her day to day. So there's nothing that they can do, and there's nothing they need to do because she is able. She has agency and the ability to make her own rational decisions, or irrational. And uh, what effect has this had on the family? It's heartbreaking because I wish I had seen the signs. I, 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 I wish we could have prevented it because that would have been much easier. And any time we try to talk to her, she just shuts down. She just wants to protect this man. And she's so um, attached now that any of us would ruin it for her if we were to um, talk to that man or do anything. It's um, we, we, we are stuck and we are sad and we feel helpless. And ideally, what would you think might be a remedy? I think prevention would have been the best remedy, of course. But uh, at this point, I, I wish that she would be willing to speak to other people uh, and get out of this isolation bubble that she's in where she feels she feels ashamed. At some level, I know she feels ashamed and she's cognitive of what's happened, but I think ultimately if she could just go ahead and meet other people who've been through this and normalize this and start to see that, forget the money in a way, just think of, you have a life ahead of you. You still have your health and your years ahead of you. Can you normalize and get over the shame and the isolation? Is I, I wish there was a group for her for that. Stephen, it's a truly heartbreaking and shocking story. And we need to take a short break. We'll welcome the panel on the other side of the break. People are artists. You, they make it their full-time job to prey on the weak. Welcome back to The Zoomer. Before the break, Stephen shared his family's tragic story of abuse. Now I'd like to welcome the panel for their reaction. And let's begin with you, Detective. I'm assuming you've heard this kind of a story before. I have, unfortunately, way too often. And uh, the outcome is often exactly what his mother's experiencing and what his family is experiencing. The, it comes down to, at the end of the day, her independent cognitive state. And in doing so, her ability or her wishes um, must be uh, accepted for what they are. We all will have our opinions on what is right, what is wrong, but at the end of the day, when it comes to the law, it's her wishes. Um, and sometimes those are clouded. 
Um, so when I deal with these issues, we have basically two sides of that. We have, how do I help her and stop that issue? I call it stopping the bleeding. I steal that from the first aid world, and I think it's extremely important to try to do that. And I rely heavily upon our community partners and various resources out there. And then the other part is trying to deal with the individual. Um, uh, we tend to call them a victim. They won't see themselves as a victim very often because of a variety of reasons. Embarrassment, um, shame, the, uh, the ability to, or they carry it. They carry the weight of the situation and blame themselves for having the opportunity to even set that up as possible, um, which of course is not theirs to carry because it's not their fault. They were put in a position with the whole intent of taking something from them. Uh, and it's, we, that is a problem that we have because the resources aren't out there to help us. I can't just flip a switch and say, oh, reality is, you know, the gentleman has no interest in you whatsoever. He's only interested in your wallet. Joanne, as a psychologist, how do you see this? It, as the detective said, elder abuse and scams are a business for these people. Uh, they don't think like non-offenders. Um, and so that's one of the issues with your mom is that she cares and she's concerned and she believes that he has normal feelings and, and he doesn't, uh, she's, uh, you know, that that's part of what hurts so deeply is that you can see that from outside. Let me ask you this, uh, with other kinds of mental illness, uh, there's the question of whether the person has insight, whether they understand there's a problem and from Stephen's story, it sounds like his mother does not. So how do you tackle that aspect? Right. I, there is a corollary with mental illness issues where people um, have rights beyond what loved ones see as being in their benefit. And I, I feel that the strength um, uh, like you really have to be a danger to yourself before, and, and you may even have to hurt somebody or yourself before you can be mandated uh, to go into treatment. The irony is that as an older person who's being offended, I'm afraid to share with you that I've been duped because that means that I'm, I'm confessing to not being cognitively all there, <laughs> so. Ah, a whole other layer. Kelly Preston, uh, do you have cases where the family comes to you as opposed to the person, or um, how often is it that the actual victim uh, wants to try for some legal recourse? I, I would say it would be a mix of both. Um, sometimes it is the victim themselves that come forward. Um, but unfortunately, by the time they get to me, they're so far down the rabbit hole that it's almost impossible to assist them because I can get them a judgment to say that, you know, Bill Smith owes them $500,000 for having taken her money or his or her money. But if that Bill Smith doesn't have any assets and no, uh, you know, doesn't own a property, doesn't have a uh, wages that we can garnish, then chances of recovery for those people, which is really, you know, my role as a lawyer is to try and get recovery for those people. Uh, you know, so the, I would say Martin's role is probably to stop the bleeding and mine is to try and find the money. So, you know, if you can't recover, then it's of little use to them. So, you know, that's the unfortunate part. And, and just to speak to the point that um, was made earlier, a lot of these people, when they come to me, they are embarrassed and they, they, they're afraid to put forward what had happened to them. And I often say to them, you know, I see frauds of many kinds, not only in elder abuse, I do a lot of fraud work. So, and I say, you know, these people are artists. You, they make it their full-time job to prey on the weak. And, you know, they, they're artists at it. They can figure out who is the weakest person in the room and they go after that person. So I try to make them feel like, 
you know, it's, it's not only you, there's many, many people. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're, you're not capable. But now a lot of times people are not capable and they do fall victim to that because they're not capable. A lot of the time what happens is people will um, befriend them and they will make them feel like they're the, you know, they're their entire world. They're going to take care of their banking. They're going to, you know, grab their debit card and run to the ATM machine to get their groceries and whatever the case may be. And that slowly but surely they become isolated from their family. And that is, I would say, a very early warning sign that something is amiss in, in that relationship. Uh, just one more question. So how hard is it to get a judgment even? Depends on how hard they fight. So I always say when I'm inter you know, when clients are retaining me, I always say, well, you know, it takes two people to dance. So if it depends on how much resistance, but let's assume for a moment that, you know, the person that we're going after doesn't have any uh, ability to retain a lawyer, they're not going to resist, I can get a judgment relatively quickly. I and mean, once you get a judgment, then you have to then collect on the judgment. So there's two steps. So so then you have to go out and collect. So if you if they have a piece of property that you can have a sheriff go and sell their their home, for example, you can you can do that. But they have to have something in order to to sell, garnish. You know, I can take a car, you know. But I mean, if you're talking five hundred thousand dollars and they're just you know under the they just have a job and you under the uh, wages act, I can only claim four percent of their wages each time that they get paid. I mean, it's going to take a long time for that person to get repaid. Right? So. OK, when we come back, how to tell if you're at risk and what you should know to protect yourself or a loved one. That's next. It's designed to string her along emotionally for the rest of her life so she never goes to the police. Welcome back. Older adults are more often targets of financial abuse because, as a group, they control a tremendous amount of this country's wealth. And in many cases, poor health, both physical and mental, makes them more vulnerable to financial predators. So how can someone tell if they're at risk and what should they know to protect themselves or a loved one? And sometimes the people you would least expect to fall victim are ensnared. Take the case of award-winning novelist Barbara Gowdy. And, Detective, I'm sure you've read about it. She admitted to this. She wrote an essay about how she took a phone call in the early morning from someone purporting to be a CIBC fraud investigator who enlisted her to help catch the bad guys by going and, and spending thousands of dollars in a day in these untraceable gift cards. And frankly, that's a scam I've heard of for quite a while. Yeah, the gift cards continue to be a problem. They're actually uh, gone between, away from your traditional ones, i.e. paying your taxes through Home Depot gift cards. So, you, know, there's, you have to wonder the rationale behind that. You know, the government of Canada doesn't accept gift cards, but yet getting caught at 2 o'clock in the morning during that period of your sleep uh, with that right tone with that right suggestion put to your ear. It usually comes with the, uh, the premise, do not hang up, or, you know, let's switch to the cell phone, hang on to that cell phone, so you don't have the opportunity to turn somebody and go, you know, does this make sense to you? Uh, we've had it that they actually send a taxi right to the door. Of course, the taxi has no idea other than the fact that they got a call. Uh, and the whole time they're riding the taxi, they're continuing to uh, be talked to uh, in the ear and given instructions. But the moment that gift card's purchased in the PIN, the, person, the identification number that's provided on the back of the card, uh, to the bad guys through the cell phone, the money's gone. It's untraceable. Uh, because the companies that support that can't pull it back. It's easy for us to sit back as quarterbackers and go, well, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Why would you pay your tax bill through a Home Depot gift card? They sell lumber, not taxes. They pay taxes, hopefully. Uh, but it happens all the time. And again, it gets back to that ability to, to, to find that way to get that, that message across to them. You know, it it it's usually just takes that ability to take a second, take a breath. 
And that's why I'm telling a lot of seniors today, if you haven't got one, get back to that answering machine in your house or use the voicemail on the cell phone. That is your filter. That's your barrier between them and you because if they don't talk to you, they can't. And by you. the way, I, I mean, I don't answer the phone and, and at certain times I figure, oh, it's gonna be a scam call. They don't leave messages. They never leave messages. No. And you will find that. And that becomes that barrier because they don't talk to you. But if you answer that phone, you tell them four things that you probably never intended to do in the first place. That the phone is active, it's an effective number, male versus female, your age group by your very voice, okay? Right off the bat, given that, and the time of day you're answering. And you never know why they're calling. It could be somebody wishing to burglar your home just to see if you're there or not. Um, so. I would have thought Kelly, that most of the, those calls are coming from overseas? Yeah, I, I think that is true. A lot of them are overseas. And actually, there was, I've watched some documentaries on that very thing. And they, they interviewed uh, a young individual from India who said it's a multi million dollar industry over there. And it's, you know, it's kind of underground. And, uh, but it's very well known that that happens and it's very commonplace. And, People go to work there the same as they would go, you know, work anywhere else. It's like they have these boiler rooms and, and occasionally they raid them, but then another one crops up the next day. Have you heard anything here, Stephen, that makes you hope that there's some way you might be able to recover some of this money? I don't believe that she will recover her money at any point. I believe this situation has been architected from the get-go, so it's irrecoverable, and is designed to string her along emotionally for the rest of her life so she never goes to the police and asks for help. I, that's, that's my belief. I hope I'm wrong. Joanne, um, again, how does somebody uh, who is a pretty sound mind become ensnared in something like, uh, you know, a fraud scam you know, somebody who gives themselves a very uh, um, Anglo name, who is clearly not Anglo, calling at, at a ridiculous hour in the morning and telling them to buy gift cards. It's, it's interesting, because when we look at what makes a person vulnerable, that you know, particularly cognitive impairment, but also social isolation is a factor. Um, you know, who else is calling me? Who else needs me? <laughs> so the m more we can involve um, the seniors socially, that becomes a protective factor so that there are real caring people. Um, uh, mobility issues become a factor. So if I can't get out and I'm homebound, that makes me more vulnerable. And, you know, remembering that this is a business for these folks and they go out of their way, scan mail. I did an investigation of scam mail and uh, social security fraud, uh, fraudulent mail is, was the worst um, because it taps into a person's fear about finances. And a lot of elders are very frightened about having enough money uh, where you know, medicine and medical technology have enabled us to live long and uh, sometimes outlive our money. So all that factors in, including that the scammers take advantage of chaotic environments. Uh, so we need to look for when an older person uh, breaks a bone and has to go into the hospital or is going for testing or is getting a ride somewhere who is taking them, who is watching over their estate at that time, because that's a time in which people can, uh, uh, offenders will swoop in and take advantage of their vulnerability. Martin, have you seen an increase in this during the pandemic? We've started seeing an increase, and I can say that from uh, across the province. The, it seems that the reports are now coming in, and we've, we're seeing spikes in it. And I'm afraid that, uh, we're going to see more of it, probably not reported, but it is going to occur because as the economic uh, pressures are put upon the, 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 the children of the uh, seniors, uh, there might be more of a demand to get assistance from the, the parent. Uh, and whether it's done willfully or not, 
Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that occur, especially if we continue to see the economy going the direction it's going to go. Uh, certain people prior to uh, COVID were familiar or comfortable with their standard of living, their toys, etc. And uh, they might find now that the economic rules are just overpowering and it's just too easy to take from mom because of the belief, I'm going to get it anyways. Hmm. Forgetting the fact it's not yours in the first place and it's never yours until the time comes if mom wants you to have it. We need to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of the Zoom. I know that this person is defrauding me, but he's such a lovely man and he calls every day at the same time. Welcome back. It's difficult to monitor financial abuse because victims rarely report it. This can be due to embarrassment, shame, or in some cases, individuals not knowing where to turn or who to trust. And in some cases, some of the victims seem to actually know they're being taken advantage of. And Detective, you have an interesting story about that. Yes, uh, most unfortunate story, but early in my uh experiences in policing involved in these particular incidents. I had occasion to go see a lady who was a retired professional, um, and uh, we were bringing to her attention that she was involved in a scam, and that obviously the person that was contacting her on a regular basis had no more interest in her other than her wallet. And I use that terminology to try to get people to put it into perspective. And her response was, uh, I know that this person is defrauding me, but he's such a lovely man and he calls every day at the same time and, and don't tell my family. Unfortunately, at that point in time, there's very little I can do for her. Uh, there, my desire is to run over and give her a big hug to let her know she's not alone, but she's buying friendship. Stephen, you're nodding your head. I, I'm thinking that in our case, in my mother's case, she, from one perspective, that she might have Maybe she paid $1.35 million just to buy this man's friendship and phone calls. And that is all she wants now and makes her happy, uh, relative to what she can, the happiness she thinks she can have. And she's, that's her investment in her happiness and her friendship. It, it, it boggles my mind, but. Kelly, I guess there's nothing legal to be done about that. Well, I mean, if somebody has capacity and they're making uh, a choice and it is, you know, uh, it's within their right to, to, do, to do that, not always will the family or their legal advisor agree, but if they, if they're of sound mind, it's, it's, they're within their right and there's really nothing you can do about it. Uh, is there any way therapy can help um, if the person kind of has insight into their situation. Right. Uh, one of the problems is we really don't have a way that older people can pay for therapy. So it's one of the issues. We Mental health services haven't really intersected uh, with elder care. Um, we're beginning to get involved in it a little bit. But just sociologically, having a view that elders uh, have a life ahead of them, <laughs> and, um, it's challenging if somebody feels that they are benefiting emotionally from this relationship and is willing to pay for it. Uh, that's the situation in the States. Are, are there decent mental health supports here? I'd like to think so, yes, but no. They're not. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of issues. Again, it comes back to the individual wishes. Uh, they play into it. If they're not prepared to admit it, you know, there's no problem. If you don't admit, there's a problem, right? Um, you also, uh, when you're dealing with a senior, for example, if you want to get a group of them together to have an opportunity to have a conversation, very often they're not all jumping into their own cars able to meet at the, the local Y at 7 o'clock at night. You have the logistics of trying to get them there and then supporting their individual needs, which are sometimes, but not all cases, a little higher than the average individual. So there's a lot of trying to get that, that gathering of one hour together and then convincing them that everybody in the room is in the same 
the predicament that you are, let's have a conversation about it. Because then it goes back to the embarrassment, the willingness to acknowledge the fact that it was somebody dear to them, especially being a family member, uh, which is most common where these problems exist. They're not strangers in most cases. It's someone very, very close to them. Um, so, and it's something we've got to get better at. And mental health across the board has always been something we've not done very well. We are slowly getting better at it as a society, in my personal opinion. This area needs a lot more effort. Kelly, what about legally? Do we need stronger laws to protect older people? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I do agree that that would be very, very helpful. Also, having a will registry system would be extremely helpful. One of the issues that we have in Ontario is will, there's no central database for people when they uh, prepare their wills. So if somebody passes away, you kind of have to, if you don't know where their will is, basically all the lawyers in the region are scrambling to, you know, an email goes out, does, who has this person's will? It's kind of archaic and, um, and it leaves open the opportunity for a multiple wills or will challenges or, you know, uh, people creating um, a will on their deathbed and nobody knows about it. So there's, there's just so many issues with respect to that. So I think changing the laws and also having a will registry would go a long way in, in helping to protect these elderly people and not only elderly people, everybody. <laughs> There's more after the break. Don't go away. Get out of the thinking of passwords, one, two, three, password. They're suggesting pass phrases. Welcome back. Let's get to our audience now for their questions, starting with Linda Darlington. Hello, Linda. Hello. My question was about a power of attorney. If someone has power of attorney over you and they're supposed to be giving you financial information and statements of expenses and so on, and they're not, what can you do about that? Just revoke your power of attorney document as quickly as you can. To revoke them? You can revoke them. Yep, and oh, that, that, okay. that is a very simple process. As the grantor, you're able to revoke it. It does not require the services of a lawyer, as long as you're cognitively aware and realize that you are now responsible for the management of your affairs. But if I may also just add a point there, nobody has power of attorney over you. No one has power over you. They are attorney under law, under the authority of a power attorney document. And the reason I like to stress that is no one has power over anybody. And if you're in a situation where you feel that they do, that is a bad relationship and needs you need to do something about it would i contact a lawyer or how would how would i do it there is uh if you have access to the internet you can t literally type in ontario revocation of power of attorney and there will be a document that pops up and you can literally fill it out and sign it you don't need a, a lawyer to do that but I'm sure okay. any lawyer would be happy to help you to revoke it if, if necessary. It's it's a one page thing, uh, and it's like quite simply you're gonna you're gonna sign it before two witnesses who are gonna attest to the fact that you did it of your own free will, and that you're fully aware that you're now responsible for your own affairs, and it's that simple. And then it's a matter of just delivering that document uh, in its original form with signatures. Uh, to the respective organizations that have been acting, like the bank, for example, maybe your telecommunication, whatever your bills, are, uh, or anything that's been affected by that individual, that attorney who's been acting supposedly in your interest, and you're obviously okay. not if you're revoking. Yes. And it, if you have a relationship with a, with a bank, they would be a, a good resource as well to assist you with that. Okay, next question from Maureen Matthews. Um, our situation is uh, grandma now has dementia and she's in a home, but she needs money for living expenses. And um, she has a daughter living in the house with her family and other people, and they refuse to leave and will not allow my husband, who's power of attorney, to liquidate or sell the house so that he can have the funds to help support his, his mother. 
and we don't know what to do. We've been to lawyers, we've been through a lot with them and there's other abuse with grandma. It's been uh, physical abuse, it's been credit card abuse. It's just been ongoing for several years. We're just sort of at our wits ends and we don't know what to do. Well, I can speak to that. There's lots of things that you can do. So you say you've been to lawyers. I mean, that is typically day in and day out. What we see is a, a scenario such as that. So you have people who have isolated or they're not permitting the power of attorney to be exercised the way it ought to so that that right. person who is the trustee is supposed to be taking um, you know, care of that person and they're supposed to be acting in the best interest of that person. So there are, you can bring an application to the court to basically force these people to do because it, it is in your right or your husband's right as the uh, power of attorney is, um, to, to enforce and ensure that his mother is being protected. Right. Well, we, we've done that and it cost thousands and thousands of dollars and they decided to hire a lawyer who just kept stalling and our lawyer kept st stalling. It just seemed to be back and forth and nothing got resolved. And then um, they ended up having to put a lien on grandma's house to cover her court costs. Okay. So the house is still owned by, by mom. By, by mom. So sell the house. Well, can we do that with them still in the house? Yep. Sell the house, get a get a lawyer to write a letter saying you have to vacate the property. They won't do it. And then you'll probably have to get a, a court order telling them that they have to vacate because you're going to sell the property. They can't, they can't prevent you from selling the property. They may say that they have claims. They may say, oh, I contributed to the mortgage and the expenses and, and all of those things. So they may have a legitimate claim. Otherwise, they could say the estate would be unjustly enriched because, you know, I made contributions to the home. But, you know, that's something that can be settled, you know, yeah. as, as part of the court proceeding. Uh, we have a final question from Linda Burt. Um Internet and email scams, I believe, are also forms of particularly now elder abuse. And while I feel confident and smart enough, maybe, and technologically uh, agile enough to notice and ignore these particular scams now, how can I protect myself in the future? First and foremost, uh, the protection of your computer. That is the means which gives you the, the, it's the bad person, the access to you. So get out of the thinking of passwords, one, two, three, password, my birth date, my first name, followed by my last name. Get out of that idea. The, today's technology, they're, they're suggesting pass phrases. So what, uh, what you do is it's minimum 14 digits, combination of capitals, small letters, figures, and numbers. And what you do is come up with something that in your life that is unique, whether you want to, I, I suggest to people, I use the Jack and Jill. Everybody knows the, Jack, the nursery rhyme Jack and Jill. So what you do is you take Jack and Jill and you manipulate that um, as your passphrase. And if you want fall, you can, and you can use the keyboard to help you. So instead of putting L's, you put ones, for example. And then if you are looking at different devices to remember the difference between which one the uniqueness of my cell phone, which is uh, versus my laptop versus my other many de devices we have. Use the device. So put cell in front of Jack and Jill. But the stronger you make that, the better your protection. Always be careful of the sites you're going to go to. Be careful of those pop-ups um, because those pop-ups are really bad. And the other thing is to, to invest in some form of uh, cybersecurity program and do your homework on those because there's a lot out there um, that necessarily make promises, but they're good up until the day you buy it. And then, you know, so much happens so quickly that they're no longer valid. So you, you want one that comes out strong and you need to do your research on that. Uh, your seniors are not the only target for that. Uh, we all are targets for that. Just listen to the number of uh, businesses that are getting ransomware uh, and happening on a daily basis. You'd be, you'd be frightened to know just how many businesses on a daily basis are, are getting targeted, so. When we come back, final thoughts from our panelists.
That's next. Welcome back to The Zoomer. It's now time for final thoughts from our panelists, starting with Kelly. So one thing I would say is kind of try and prevent, do a little bit of preventative maintenance. Have your wills and power of attorneys prepared. Store your will and your powers of attorney with, with the lawyer and have it done early. Like we're, we're all, don't think that uh, you have to be elderly to do a will. I mean, we're we're all going to get there eventually. So do it in advance so that you, you safeguard and protect yourself. Stephen. I, I would want to share with people like my mom in the position where they feel isolated, they feel alone, they feel they feel ashamed. I'd want them to know they're not alone. They shouldn't be ashamed. Um, Sometimes people will come in, in at your moment of greatest vulnerability and, and take advantage. And uh, there's nothing wrong with you or what you did. And there is help there if you're willing to ask for it. People do care about you. Martin. I just want to build on what Stephen said. You did nothing wrong other than be that great person that you are. Just keep being that person that you are and realize that there's people out there that will help you. Joanne? Right, just to echo that um, individuals should not feel um, ashamed or embarrassed without you know, seeking some support. And, and one of the factors that I didn't bring up that I want to make sure I got in is a substance abuse. I, I've seen people sign over their homes to substance abusing children instead of um, um, so that they can have a place to live. Um, and it's, it's sad. Thank you for being with us. The scams keep getting more sophisticated and almost anyone can be victimized. Don't let embarrassment stop you from getting help. We'll see you soon. It's time to Zoom out.